Uh, we're here to hear a talk about adding a backend cube proxy next generation, a backend to cube proxy next generation by Rashes and Neha from VMware. Let's give them a warm welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, good morning. Welcome everyone to this session on adding a backend to cube proxy next gen. Uh, so this is going to be uh, focused around like concepts or basic concepts around Kube proxy, uh, Kube proxy next gen, backends uh, to Kube proxy next gen, and things like that. Uh, so before we get started, can I get like a quick show of hands of how many people have heard about KPNG or Kube proxy next gen? One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so like four people in the room and four or five, and how many have like tried or used uh, KPNG or? All right, like Ricardo, <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, I hope that uh, you know all of you will be able to get something new out of this uh, session. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so who are we? Uh, I'm Rajas Kakurkar. I am a software engineer at VMware, um, and I'm also contributing to upstream Kubernetes, mostly in SIG network areas of late. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm Nihal Oya. I'm Working in the Tanzu Service Mesh team, I'm also contributing to the upstream Kubernetes, mostly in the SIG network in this project. Cool. Uh, so, so we're going to talk about uh, KPNG or Kubeproxy next gen. Uh, go through the, like the current state of Kubeproxy and then focus on backend aspects. All right. Okay. So, what is Kubeproxy next gen? So, this is like a working group under special interest group network, it's SIG network in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, so we're basically trying to redesign the architecture of Kube proxy over here. Uh, so we're aimed at like decoupling like the data plane from like the Kubernetes control plane, uh, improving scalability, improving the ability to integrate third party environments, uh, being library oriented uh, to allow packaging logic at distributors as well and things like that. All right. Okay, so the problem at hand over here is that if any client tries to reach out to a service, then uh, they should be routed to one of the endpoints, right? Like one of the underlying parts that run the app. So the way cupping tries to solve this is through something like a cupping server. So this cupping server is, um, it has an API independent of the Kubernetes API. It's like a local host gRPC server, which tries to watch Kubernetes API server for like services and endpoint resources. And then it processes this uh, with uh, like, you know, Kubernetes business logic, like topology, computation, and things like that. And then provides like a local state to a cupping backend. So a cupping backend um, is, there can be like different backends. They can be like NF tables, IP tables, user space, and so on. And the backend is then responsible to take the state from the server and then implement the routing rules or the specific proxy, right? Like maybe user space mode or IP tables mode and so on. All right. So, and then the client can go through those networking rules and then reach the underlying part of the service. Cool. So this is what cupping architecture looks like. <laughs> um, I don't expect y'all to go through like all of these bits in one go, but like what I'm trying to highlight over here is that there's a split between like Kubernetes API and the cupping uh, server API. Um, there's a decoupling between like uh, what, which part watches the Kubernetes API server and which part processes that and you know does uh, the the networking rules part of it, right? Like the point to highlight over here is like a backend is a pluggable entity. It comes with its own Go mod. It has its own dependencies. So a cupping backend can grow at its own space independent of the server. Uh, all right, and we're going to focus on the backend aspect a lot uh, in this. Okay, so this is cool, but why do we even care? So for that, we'll have to understand uh, the current state of Kube proxy, and Neha is going to walk us through that. Yeah. So let's try to understand what is Kube proxy. So as we probably know, like Kube proxy is the Kubernetes proxy which runs on every node in the cluster. It manages the service abstraction within the Kubernetes. It runs as a demon set within the Kubernetes and uh, yeah, it runs as a demon set within the Kubernetes and it uh, 
manages the uh, service abstraction within the kubernetes if you I'll do that yeah i can take care of this yeah okay yeah so let's take a look at this diagram uh, so whenever any new services is created uh, uh, there is a change in the endpoint resources if you see like this information is then persisted in the api server and it is continuously synced with the queue proxy so what happens actually is whenever any new service is created in the kubernetes underneath there is a change in the endpoint resources which happens and queue proxy uh, tries to program the network rules on each of the node in the kubernetes cluster and the traffic is then re redirected to the appropriate backend ports so if you see from this diagram the traffic suppose a uh, suppose a service is created in the kubernetes cluster let's say a nginx service which is exposed as a cluster ip so what actually happens is the traffic is comes to the cluster ip but if you see from this diagram the traffic is actually redirecting to the queue proxy and then queue proxy is redirecting to the backend port so this is a screenshot from the user space mode so here what is actually happening is the traffic is going to queue proxy and then it is going to the backend port so what will actually happen in the uh, next so what so uh, if you see from this picture in the ip tables and the ipvs mode whenever a service is created the traffic instead of going to the queue proxy the traffic is coming to the cluster ip and from the cluster ip it is redirecting to the backend ports so if you see all the routing is happening in the kernel space so this is the one advantage of using ip tables over the user space mode let's uh, this is the uh, diagram which is from the ipvs mode if you see here the ipvs uh, the cluster ip is acting as a virtual server here this ip does not change as we all know and uh, the client has to just store this information if he wants to redirect the traffic to the backend ports otherwise if services would have not exist in the kubernetes the traffic would have to actually go to the backend ports and as the ports are ephemeral it is very difficult to keep track of all these ips so this is uh, we have seen what is queue proxy let's move over to some of the limitations of the queue proxy uh, as we see like queue proxy does the networking part and kubernetes api server actually watches the bits in the single process this block th this is a blog post from open api which we have took where you see like as and when the nodes increases in the cluster the kubernetes api server has a heavy load of watching all these endpoints so if you see as and when the nodes increases in the cluster the kubernetes api server has a, a very high load and this is we see is a pain point of queue proxy this is the uh, second limitation of queue proxy if we see from this picture here like uh, the queue proxy implementation is complicated because if you see like uh, the cni providers which you have in the market like calico and tria if we want to write our own proxy here they have to implement their uh, the cni like calico has already has its own proxy because uh, which has replaces the queue proxy but if you see they have to copy paste the code from the existing queue proxy and which we see is a difficult uh, and very pain right now uh, the similar situation happens with calico as well like uh, they have their own proxy they are building their own queue proxy but there has to be a copy pasting from the existing queue proxy code so this is about the i want to highlight here about the uh, queue proxy knowledge which we have in the community as we know like uh, very few people in the community understand about queue proxy and also about the history of what it actually does and all the context so there is this twitter example here which uh, where we wanted to know like why service port has names so actually tim hawken has uh, replied this with uh, uh, why the context behind it and actually like there is a pr also which got created in 2015 and on this so these are all the like pain points we see and limitation of queue proxy now let's see how these are addressed in cupping and uh, rajas will actually walk you through now how the backend is added in cupping all right uh, so now that we've looked at um, the limit some of the limitations of queue proxy and how like you know very few people in the community have like context on the history of queue proxy and things like that that's like one of the problems we're trying to uh you know solve with cupping wherein we're trying to build a community around it like both of us are like pretty much new to networking aspects and things like that uh so the we're trying to break that bridge you know to get in uh to basically cross that and come and contribute to uh something like cupping all right so now uh, let's take a look at uh 
how to add a backend uh, in cupping. So we've already looked at this uh, diagram a while back. Uh, I just want to highlight that adding a backend takes uh, two things. One is setting up the communication between the server and uh, the you know the underlying proxy or through something called as a sync interface uh, on like what the backend, how the backend has to. No problem. Uh, how how the backend has to um, basically interpret the signal that it receives to, from the server and then pass it on to the underlying logic of the proxy. And also, yeah, so this is like one part is setting up the communication and the other part is like, you know, the backend logic. Cool. So this is what like a backend sync interface looks like, wherein like, you know, these are all the methods that you have to implement to set up like a backend in cupping. Setup is like one of the most important methods wherein you would initialize your proxy. Um, then, it, then, comes, then it comes to something like a service listener, wherein we have like set service, delete service. So uh, these things are called when a new service is added or updated or a service is deleted. So it depends on the implementation of the proxy or then how you implement this uh, depending on uh, the mode. And similarly, there's something like set endpoint and delete endpoint. So a set endpoint will be followed um, like, you know, after set service and uh, likewise for delete endpoint. Cool. So now let's like focus on the user space mode, right? Uh, on how this backend was added in cupping. Uh, but before that, we have to know how user space mode works in kubeproxy. So uh, you like just jumping back to the history of uh, kubeproxy and things like that. Like this was like the first mode which was added uh, to kubeproxy, and then we got moved on to something like IP tables and IPVS and things like that. Um, even though this is sort of deprecated, it's easier to understand the functioning uh, via user space mode and then, you know, move on to something like IP tables and IPVS. So that's why we've taken uh, this example. So let's let's take a look at how uh, user space works in kubeproxy. Yeah. So uh, we have this diagram of uh, which explains the user space mode. So what actually happens is like whenever any new service is created in the cluster. So underneath there are the endpoint resources which gets created. So QProx is continuously watching the Kubernetes API server for the creation and deletion of all these endpoints resources and the services. So whenever it, the traffic comes to this uh, service IP or uh, to the uh, to the service IP, there is a IP table rules which gets programmed in the kernel. So the traffic actually goes to the IP tables. Uh, if you see here, like localhost 8080, from the IP table, it identifies like which kube proxy node it has to go back. Like it is doing a switch from the kernel space to the user space, which is actually a kube proxy pod. And from the kube proxy pod, it again redirects to the kernel to the appropriate backend pods. So we see here like the packet is actually switching from kernel space to user space and then again to the kernel space. So I think this is uh, that I think this is not the preferred uh, method right now. And uh, obviously, like we have moved over to IP tables and IPVS. And that's why like we have like uh, see that the user space is deprecated and it is not being the preferred choice right now. So let's see like uh, how this backend can be added in Cupic. Yep. Also a shout out to Arthur. Uh, this diagram is from his blog post on like, you know, how you can understand uh, user space uh, or any modes in kubeproxy and things like that. Cool. So, uh, so these are like the cupping bits, right? Like all the GRTC calls that come from the cupping server to the backend and things like that. And these are all the things that you have to impl implement from the cupping side. So let's just focus on something like set service. So this is where the kube proxy logic kicks in. So what we've done over here is basically ported code from kube proxy user space mode to cupping. Uh, so uh, instead of using the uh, Kubernetes V1 API for like services endpoints, we've used like uh, the API implemented in cupping. So Focusing back on how Kube proxy does uh, user space, so it, it implements something called as a service change tracker, which has like a current service and a previous service. So this is basically how uh, it can make sense of how where the services are added, whether they are updated, and how to keep a track of uh, services. So once you update uh, uh, 
a service change tracker once the service is added. And similarly, when a service is deleted, then things move to something called a sync proxy rule. So this is where uh, once the service change tracker has been updated, it will try to sync all of those rules. Uh, the important bits that happen over here are something like merge service and unmerge service. So this part is responsible for opening that extra port doing the round robin algorithm and all of those bits, right? All of them happen in this uh, sync proxy rules. It also opens like a socket and then, uh, you know, watches for uh, accepts on the so socket, then sees if it can uh, connect to the endpoint. And that is how uh, it kind of adds uh, that endpoints in that round robin fashion. Similarly, for endpoints, like endpoint slices are not implemented in uh, user space mode, but for whenever there's an endpoint added or updated, it keeps a track of the state of endpoints in the round robin load balancer. And then again, like it kind of updates it whenever there's a change. Similarly, for a delete endpoint. Uh, OK, so uh, one more thing I want to highlight over here is this is how QProxy does implementation using something like service change tracker. This is what is done for IP tables as well, right? Wherein a service change tracker is used. Uh, Cupping has a default backend called as NF tables, uh, which uses a slightly different method wherein it takes the full state from the cupping server and then the backend does a diff on what has what has changed or whether the rules have to be written or not and you know things like that so a bit of processing is done on uh the backend part as well this is another approach that you can take to write a backend in in cupping uh so if you go into cupping repository so cupping repository lives in kubernetes 6 org uh, there is in in examples uh, there is something called as user space example cupping where Mikhail has actually written like a skeleton for how you can do it using the you know the full state model. Um, if you are interested in knowing about NF tables and you know how it is different from IP tables and things like that, there's like a great uh, video by John Holly on that. Um, also, if you want to get some more context around cupping, there's the uh, in like you know the in progress kep wherein the, you'll find a ton of context on what all we've we've been talking over here. Apart from that, a meme has like a great series of blog posts on how uh, user space backend works in Windows and uh, comparing it to how it works in cupping, right? Uh, like adding it, I adding window, Windows user space to cupping and QProxy. Uh, so there's, this is another great series of blog posts you can take a look at. Also, Jay has another series on blog posts on how NF tables uh, or NFT backend works in Cupping. Cool. So I have a demo prepared on uh, how user space backend works uh, like in, in Cupping. And this is sort of pre-recorded. Uh, I just like, you know, I recorded it just so that things don't go, uh, you know, things don't mess up at the last moment. So. Okay, so like any other Kubernetes demo, it starts with a cluster. So I have a three node uh, kind cluster over here, uh, which is running cupping. Uh, so, yeah. So this is running uh, cupping and not QProxy. I got this up using something called as uh, hack test e2e.sh. So this is a script that lives in cupping repository. Uh, this is pretty intuitive wherein you can uh, say, you know, which IP uh, version you want to use, which backend you want to use. And we actually use this script in CI. So if you give a hyphen D mode, uh, it will not run conformance tests. Otherwise, it will run conformance tests for you. Uh, so what this does is it builds cupping server, cupping backend, uh, depending on the changes that you've done, and then uh, deploys uh, Thing. Okay, so this is the cupping. So cupping is deployed as a daemon set, right? Like Q proxy. So this is what the cupping daemon set looks like. Um, so you can see it comes with like two containers. So this is the cupping server, which is uh, basically listening to the you know Kubernetes uh, resources, and then there is the cupping uh, backend container. Uh, which is listening to the cupping server, right? And then processing whatever signal it gets from cupping server. Uh, so this is what the daemon set looks like. Um, 
Okay. Okay. So what I am, what I've done in this demo is that I'm going to create, I'm going to play with services and things like that. And, you know, watch the logs and how cupping, you know, is intuitive enough to debug and things like that. So, uh, what, what is happening over here is that I'll just fast forward a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so in this pane, I am watching, I basically exec into one of the nodes. Uh, just so the reason I've done this is to look at the IP tables rules which are created. Uh, so that is what this pane is going to do. Uh, in the other pane, what I'm doing is l watching the logs of a cupping pod and specifically the backend container. So th th this is basically what the logs look like and we'll see how they change when a service is created and things like that. So in this pane, I'm watching the logs of cupping pod uh, and specifically the backend container. Uh, and in the other pane, what I'm doing is I'm execing into uh, the cupping server container and running something called as cupping node log uh, CLI. So what I'm doing over here is I am listening to the cupping server and I'll, I'll get to see what cupping server sends at a node level. So th this is basically like a node level view uh, that a cupping backend can see. So you, whenever the, the good thing about this node log is it will continually try to watch uh, the cupping server. But when you started the first time, you can see the entire state of your cluster. You can see all of the services and endpoints, right? So these are the only two resources that are needed uh, by a backend to, you know, implement it, uh, its networking rules. So that is the information that it's providing over here. Okay, so now that the stage has been set and, you know, all of the pains have been set up, uh, uh, I'm going to create like a simple deployment of Echo Server and then uh, create a simple cluster IP service for that. So if you notice the moment uh, the cluster IP service gets created over here, we should see some changes in the node log and also in the cupping uh, backend container. Uh, yeah, so things changed which is expected. And now let's see like what state we got. So here we are looking at the node log. You can see uh, the new service has been added. Like this is the state that was received by the cupping backend. Uh, what type of service is it? It is like, you know, what are the endpoints that the service is running on? Like this is all it requires. And with this information, the backend will do its job. It will, you know, create those networking rules and things like that. We can also see uh, what happened in the backend container. So it, it got the service change and then it called something like on service add. So this is basically, you know, it'll move to merge service and, you know, all of the user space uh, logic will kick in. Also, I, I, I think I missed out on mentioning that this is running in user space mode and not in uh, uh, IP tables or NFT mode. All right. Cool. So now uh, what, what we can do is we can also like, remember the node that we have, we had exec into, we can run something like IP table save and, uh, you know, look at all of the IP tables or rules that were created. Like this is like a lot of rules, but, uh, we can just grab on like, you know, whatever, uh, service name we have. And this is like cool stuff. So these are the rules that are created when, uh, this echo service was just created, you know, by the backend. Uh, and as you can see, like, you know, it's just, this is like a node IP and it's, it has just opened this proxy port where the route, the round robin will happen. Right. So anything, so this is 10.96.79 is the service IP, uh, the cluster IP. So any request that comes over here that gets, uh, just routed to the node. So things come in the kernel space and they move to users, uh, user space, now the routing will happen in user space and then it'll again point it to one of the parts, right? The backends and move to the kernel space. So basically this is how uh, user space is working. The other uh, aspect is we can actually curl the service. Uh, here I have tried to curl uh, 
I've tried to curl the service on that port. So I'm inside the inside one of the nodes. So that is why the cluster IP service is accessible for me. The reason I chose Echo Server is that it gives me an yeah, like some sort of information on which backend pod, right? It is routing to. Why this is important is that if I keep on pinging this service according to a round robin, uh, you know, it should keep on changing um, the backend pod. So that is basically what I'm going to do over here. Yeah, so I've been like continuously pinging the service over here. So it is, you know, shuffling from 10, 24413 to 10, 24423, right? Um, like if I keep on doing it, this is how the round robin is kicking in. And this is how we have uh, user space mode working in cupping. Uh, there's a bit of the demo left in in a way wherein I was like, you know, changing the service type from something like cluster IP to node port and then seeing how that gets reflected. You know, in this case, it won't be a service ad, but a service update wherein, you know, the endpoints have changed, you know, the type of service have ch has changed. Uh, and, you know, uh, if we look at the rules, then, uh, you know, the rules have been updated wherein node port has come into the picture over here. Uh, and and th and things like that. So I just just wanted to point that out, but I'm running short of time. So I'll just skim through this. And the last important bit that I want to point out over here is that uh, similar to node log, there is something called as a cupping global log. So if I replace this node log with something called as a global log, uh, as long as I can spell global log correctly, uh, See, this is what the cupping server sees, right? This this involves all the Kubernetes aspects, you know, all the node names and things like that, like that, and uh, the service and uh, endpoints resources, right? So this is the state that is received by the cupping server, and and it filters this out, does you know whatever processing it requires. It may involve comp topology computation or any Kubernetes business logic, and then uh, gives like a diff to um, the node to implement uh, its networking logic. All right, so this is what I had for the demo. And what I'm going to do is, yeah, so these are some more cupping resources that you can take a look at. Yeah, so as Rajas already mentioned about the few cupping resources, so we have few more here, like there are like few TGIK and entire talks which happens and uh, which already have the cupping, uh, how it works and the ongoing story of it. So if you're interested, please have a look at it. There is also one blog post uh, by Lars on how to write your own proxy. Here. So if you want to take a look at it and you can start writing your own proxy. <laughs> so let's do a quick recap of what we have learned, what is Kapig. And uh, so if you see like Kapig has actually like decoupled architecture of control plane and data plane. So what we can do here is like if you want to write your own proxy here, you can start writing your own proxy from scratch without uh, like depending on the Kubernetes API server and you can maintain your own fork. So CNI like uh, the plugins no longer have to sync with your group proxy code. Uh, we also see here like the Kubernetes API server has been benefited from like uh, watching the endpoints and the load is also reduced. So this also provides a possibility for the new anyone who wants to start writing your own proxy here, which can be maintained outside of the Kubernetes. So what's next for Kapik? Okay, yeah. So the Kapik team is trying to like uh, the ongoing work and what are the next actions planned ahead. So we are trying to make all the backends conformant. Like uh, we already have the code and uh, it's already in the like uh, in our repository. But uh, we are trying to make like uh, the backends conformant so that they pass the basic test. So the team is working on that. We are also ident uh, working on identifying like how you can replace your group proxy with Kapik. So if uh, if anyone wants and want interested in that, we can talk on that as well. So the team is working on that. And uh, we already have an in-progress cap. So uh, if anyone wants to uh, work on that or have any queries, 
so we can take that look and we can also make it to completion yeah, yeah. so uh I'm running short time, uh, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the people behind Cupping. So this is Mikhail. Uh, he is responsible for like Cupping server and, you know, the NF table backends. Jay is sort of everywhere when it comes to Cupping. Uh, he helped Vivek with IP tables backend. Anusha is also helping with IP tables backends. Um, Ricardo is <laughs> the one who gave us like, you know, the initial IPVS uh, implementation. And then Lars helped on both of these things. Hanumanth is helping on IPVS. Uh, so Neha is also helping on IPVS. She's also one of the founding members of the Cupping CI team. Um, along with Friedrich, uh, we got like invaluable inputs from uh, Antonio on, on CI for Cupping. Uh, Doug has been helping on CI and also helping out Jay on Windows kernel space implementation. Amim is the one who added uh, Windows user space implementation for Cupping. Um, Pear has been helping us with IPv6 support. And I've been helping Jay with like, you know, the Linux uh, user space support. So like these are all the people behind Cupping. And where to find us? We are uh, uh, SIG Network KPNG on k Slack. If you're not on k Slack, join us on slack.k8.io. We have bi-weekly, uh, we have weekly meetings on Fridays and Wednesdays, one in APEC and one in PST. Um, so we also hang out like, you know, uh, if people are interested uh, on uh, like, you know, hacking with us on Cupping, we'll pair with you all and, you know, help you all out. So 